apologize for the crash of Zoom. I hope this recording finds you well, and I hope this is also an informative uh, recorded talk. My talk is on the model for facilitating engineering design and its impact in undergraduate STEM laboratory. And my kind of outline for the talk today is beginning with a motivation that's going to lead into an overall program that we have funded by the NSF, and that's improving problem solving skills of engineering undergraduate students by facilitating engineering design in introductory physics. And so with that, I'll kind of give a brief discussion about how we frame engineering design, and then we'll lead into three key studies of what's informing how we're implementing our project, and as well as the future work um, that's ongoing with the project as well. So kind of the main motivation for what kind of brought about our project was really thinking about the curriculum that we're kind of going through. Um, you know, if you really think about introductory sim courses and the kinds of problems and challenges that we give students, they're often a lot of times into the chapter type problems or they're problems that are very well structured. They provide a lot of the needed information for students to be able to go on the path of a solution. And it's usually a one solution type path where you're going to like one purposeful correct answer. But the reality is if you wanna think about scientists and engineers, they often in their own job environments are not solving these well structured type problems. They're often dealing with ill structured problems. Maybe not all the information is provided to them. Uh, maybe they're required to make some assumptions and approximations and there could be multiple paths of solutions and possible solution options. That's gonna require them to consider alternatives and trade-offs. And so if you wanna think about 21st century workforce skill development, even if you're looking at reform documents across the US and Canada, there's a lot of similar overlaps. You know, this idea of being multidisciplinary or cross-cutting concepts, the idea of thinking about science and engineering practices and problem solving as being a big highlight in these kind of uh, skill development, as well as thinking about evidence-based reasoning or argumentation. Uh, and, you know, we have these other skills in terms of mathematical reasoning, modeling, all kind of packaged together. And we wanna be able to create a way for students to have these skill development experiences as well as learning the content. Um, so with that, there is a growing interest in student-centered pedagogical innovations that would integrate science learning and engineering design in the hopes to highlight real world applications and give a sense of solving more ill-structured problems in a real world applicational sense. Um, but the aim is also to have these innovations that would have a student's interest and motivation enhancement that could enhance uh, academic success for students, provide opportunities for teamwork, communicational skills, and metacognitive skill development, enhance evidence-based discourse, as well as enhance student identity as engineers and scientists, all in the hopes of retaining and recruiting uh, our STEM pipeline. So the way we frame integrated STEM as an approach uh, for learning of STEM content alongside STEM practices. And its purpose is to kind of serve as a meaningful context to facilitate learners um, in their evidence-based reasoning or argumentation skill development, because it hopefully is gonna be leveraged to provide an experience in which you can incorporate multiple justifications, multiple paths of solutions, um, the trade-offs aspect, in um, all their decision-making processes and steps that they would take in a design activity. Now, thinking about integrated STEM and literature thus far, we do find a lot of literature centered around what we call the design science gap. And that's really just referring to the idea that a student who might be you know, interacting with a design activity might end up using more of a trial and error strategy to invent a design or come up with a solution rather than in the process engaging and thinking about, well, what science concepts or mathematical concepts could I use to inform what it is I'm doing real time as I'm inventing a design or a solution. Um, and also with that kind of hand in hand, there's a tendency, if you're using trial and error strategies, you're probably not really providing much evidentiary support on how you're justifying what it is your des design decision or, or path solution should be. So for this project, um, there's kind of three central goals, uh, and that's focusing on the development, implementation, 
and assessment of engineering design activities for students. Um, and again, these students are enrolled in an introductory physics course. So we'll be looking at the development of activities that incorporate engineering design into our physics laboratory settings, as well as this implementation of those activities. And how do we assess these activities looking at student learning and outcomes? Now, briefly, what is engineering design? Um, so we have a kind of an outline process on the right-hand side. Now, one caveat I do want to say is it looks like in this particular representation, although there are other representations, it looks like it's a linear process, but it's not. It's actually a very cyclic process. Um, so just as this kind of one mapping, kind of one representation, again, though, like many of the representations for engineering design, they hit on a lot of these exact same kind of uh, points of, of process, uh, going from designing the problem, learning about your problem, which is all about problem scoping, to coming up with a solution, testing that solution, and evaluating. So there's a solution generation process. And between these two big processes is always going to have this element of communication and teamwork within it. Now, we consider engineering design as a recursive activity that's going to result in some form of an artifact. It could be a physical artifact, something that's tangible, or something that could be a virtual representation. Maybe it's a simulation or a CAD design. It could also be physical, just like you know, a written report or some kind of mock setup. Now, thinking about design tasks, there have been identified seven key essential features for a good design task. And that's going to be client-driven, goal-oriented, having an authentic context to it, providing a mechanism for criteria and constraints, allowing students to be familiar with materials, resources, and tools that they can use at hand to come up with a solution, the ability to have a problem defined in such a way that there could be multiple solutions, and the solution itself is gonna turn into an artifact or process of some sort, again, that could be physical or virtual, as well as having a strong element of teamwork. So the first study is actually more of a theoretical study. It's coming up with a theoretical framework for how we can consider evidence in terms of engineering design and coming up with a solution when this engineering design activity is situated in physics learning and can bring in other uh, disciplines as well. So if we want to think about it, um, both science and engineering practices have a key element about engaging in argumentation from evidence. And that's also has been identified as a strong, crucial 24th century workforce skill. However, if you really think about among the disciplines, there are distinctions in how argumentation has been viewed or implemented. So for example, in science, argumentation is often associated with scientific inquiry to explain natural phenomena. In mathematics, argumentation is often viewed as something about you know, having mathematical proofs based on established axioms and theorems. And it, it, both in engineering and technology, argumentation is often used as a means to search for solutions, justify decisions, and assess trade-offs. However, if we think about the disciplines and these distinctions for their implementation or what might be considered appropriate evidence as utilized by the various disciplines or communities of practice, that becomes something of an important key consideration. So we need to understand how various disciplines or communities of practice negotiate the understanding and implementation of argumentation itself. So if we're looking at the context of integrated STEM, where we have multiple communities of practices or multiple disciplines merging together, there are gonna be impl implications on the ways to support argumentation, how to assess it both reliably and with validity, and how are we gonna be able to understand the incorporation of ideas and evidences uh, along multiple dimensions, timelines, um, coming together as you know, this product, this artifact that's gonna come about. So the model that we've come up with is gonna address an important issue in argumentation. And it's really looking at the underspecified nature of evidence itself. And if you look at policy documents and standards, um, there is kind of a lack of specificity about what evidence is, mm, especially what might be considered appropriate evidence in a given discipline or a given uh, community of practice. 
experience. And if you think about it, consequently, you know, learners could easily use a variety of evidence to support claims that they're asked to make. Um, and those evidences could be something from a media, social media, uh, personal experience, some observed pattern that they know of, um, some empirical data that they would have collected. So there's a whole repertoire of evidences that one could bring to bear in any kind of uh, decision-making task. And so the lack of clarity of evidentiary standards makes it difficult for learners to engage in productive critique about evidence, let alone the collection of methods, alternative interpretations, and the triangulation uh, from multiple evidences itself. So I know it's kind of a, a big, broad picture here, uh, but this is the model and I'll try to walk you through it. So on the right hand side in the big uh, red call out uh, is basically the engineering design process itself, as we defined earlier, going from, you know, problem scoping through solution generation. And on the very far right for each of those steps is kind of a brief definition about what that is exactly if you're not familiar with. Now, one of the things that, again, I wanna stress is yes, the visualization looks like it's linear, but it's a very cyclic process. So even if you come down to evaluation, you could be circling back to any other key step up above um, for the needs based on how you're evaluating uh, your solution itself. So maybe it might mean that you have gone through a whole process, you've tested a solution, you're evaluating it, but maybe you're recognizing that you need to further understand the problem again. So you're going somewhere back up to problem scoping or maybe it's more of thinking about the implementation itself, what have you. So you can always be having all these kind of circles back. Now, in terms of argumentation itself or evidence-based reasoning, really, if you think about it, argumentation can seed itself in any one of these steps at any one point in time. So you could have an argument about how you're defining your problem, about the criteria, the constraints that you're trying to identify, um, the clients and end users as well, down to thinking about, you know, what are the relevant concepts that we need to do to understand our problem? Maybe it's something about the prototyping or the process in which you're going to be implementing your plan itself. Or maybe it's down all the way to thinking about how you're interpreting the results and kind of evaluating how you're doing the results. And maybe there's different interpretations that you have to weigh the trade-offs on. So the idea here is that at any step in the engineering design process can lend itself to having an argument or an evidence-based reasoning moment to it. And again, because this process is very cyclic, you could be coming back and revisiting back with a whole new argument or an enhanced argument at any point in time. Now on the left-hand side is thinking about integrated STEM itself. So imagine that we have an integrated STEM task where we're using engineering as kind of the anchor to bring in the science learning, the mathematics learning, or the technology learnings into that. So engineering design is kind of providing that real world context in which we're then pulling in our different disciplines. Now, if you think about the kinds of evidences that have been identified in literature as often used for science, technology, and mathematics, um, for example, let's say we're talking about science itself. We're looking at observations, measurements, data simulations, scientific principles, more often than not as part of, of our justifications. And mathematics, you know, you, again, you have patterns, you might have theorems and axioms, um, as well as mathematical rules. And if you think about technology, again, it's models, simulations, codings, et cetera. And in engineering, more often in literature, it's cited as being evidence of data, maybe something about ethical considerations or criteria considerations, again, bringing in science and the mathematical underpinnings into the uh, design process as well. So as you can see, there's a lot of similarities, but as well as some differences, but we have to consider how these can be appropriately used as overlaps um, or integrations into a design activity to think about how are they bringing in certain evidences the context in which you're using the evidence, the linkages that they're making as they're making overall grander arguments. Um, so all these different kind of nuances that have to come into considerations, but it's more of highlighting and mapping out what are some of the kind of key evidences to get students really thinking more in that kind of discipline or community practice kind of type thinking to bring in uh, what would be more considered maybe appropriate evidences or appropriate usages of evidence. So with that, we were gonna build on um, knowing our model. 
to think about engineering design activities, thinking about what will be the kind of overall outcomes and how will we would assess. So the context of this project on the whole is a large lecture, uh, first semester calculus-based uh, physics course. Main enrollment is engineering majors. We roughly run around 2,400 students annually in this course. Um, and the focus is usually on you know, bringing in engineering design uh, and bringing in all these other experiences that they might have as well. Uh, the course format is two lectures per week, 50 minutes. We have one recitation section um, that's 50 minutes and students will experience a two hour laboratory in that week as well. The curriculum is matter and interactions and the beauty about matter and interactions, it's kind of principle based forming focuses on three key principles, uh, momentum, energy, and anger momentum. It highlights the need for systems thinking. So that means defining your systems and surroundings, uh, modeling going from you know, the distinctions of point particle modeling to extended system modeling, and um, also the need to highlight assumptions and approximations that one would take in a, in a solution. So in this project, laboratory experiences were modified to integrate learning of science along with an engineering design experience. So each of the three course components um, are not treated as independent experiences, but are instead working together synergistically with each other. So for example, let's say uh, in lecture, we have you know, the instructor going through the big concepts that might be presented that week, but also in class asking students to reflect upon how what they're learning that week could inform the engineering design challenge that they'll be wrestling with in laboratory. And in recitation, yes, it's going to be more calculational based, but the problems that they're working on too have a lot of mappages and linkages to the engineering design challenge that they're working on, just using more of the kind of mathematical formulisms and, and equations that they would have been learning about that week. And all this kind of synergistic uh, linkages is based on expansive framing. And so for us, we cr uh, created um, engineering design texts uh, that again, pull in the seven essential features that I've highlighted previously for a, a good design task. And also um, the design experiences were guided by criteria used to assess uh, curriculum materials as highlighted by uh, Guzzi and Moore. Now in thinking about how we're gonna blend together an engineering design challenge experience with science learning, we were thinking about how you know we can bring in um, inquiry. So let's say a 3E learning cycle for science and layering that onto with the engineering design process as well. Meaning that you might have the engineering design process as a free flow kind of interchange between uh, kind of the big steps that you do for engineering design, but providing detour times in which students would engage in science learning itself through the inquiry type process. And mind you too, um, in the laboratory inquiry-based experiences, that's gonna be an integration of hands-on equipment along with vPython or GlowStrip coding. So there'll be an element of computational thinking or coding as well to think about how those simulations or the principles that they're working with or the data that they're collecting can inform their engineering design activity. The way we treat this as you know, a design challenge experience is going to be multi-week experience. We kind of break it down into you know, what are the big features, a big highlight each week, at least on terms of the engineering design of things. And then depending upon when this is happening and taking place in a semester, we think about what sciences, concepts that they need to be working with to provide those experiences in laboratory. But the idea is, let's say if we start our first week of an engineering design challenge, you're providing an opportunity for students to learn about what the challenge is gonna be and think about you know, plans for a solution as well as plans for implementation and having an implementation time. And then all the way down to thinking about evaluation. Um, for us, uh, materials, tools, and resources are often gonna include a design briefs, uh, maybe weekly uh, worksheets as well. And also you know, thinking about the professional development and guidelines that we set for our TAs and the weekly meetings that we have for them and the debriefs that we have with them. We have kind of like three big uh, data collection points here. 
Um, one is starting off with a Mars lander kind of design project that we've developed. We've also developed a engineering design project focusing on animated guided vehicles, as well as in um, having an engineering design project that focuses on, let's say you have a remote island of an endangered species. You have to get food or resources to that island, but you don't want to have uh, large environmental impacts. You want to keep that at minimum. So how do you develop a mechanism to deliver um, those said items? So in our second study, we've been implementing engineering design challenges. We wanted to know what are students and TA perceptions of those design challenges in our laboratories. Um, so again, this is just kind of a brief rundown. Uh, this data from spring 2021, this was during COVID time. Um, so this was uh, online laboratory via Zoom with breakout sessions. Uh, there was a physical hands-on component, but that was using IO Labs as kind of a, a tool kit itself, kind of a packaged kit in which you have uh, sensors and what have you that integrates into a computer, but you can collect data, as well as also the computational coding as well. And that's from vPython or GlowScript. Um, it is a multi-week experience, but this happens to be at the latter part of the semester when we introduce this first design challenge. And it's kind of broken into... Uh, you know, the kind of key steps to allow students to both engage in a step of engineering design, frequently come back to it each subsequent week, as well as doing specific activities that are the inquiry activities to learn about certain key science concepts. Let's say talking about air drag. Now we have two groups of participants. Obviously, it's going to be the students themselves as well as the graduate TAs. The students themselves would have completed an end of semester survey and the graduate TAs would have participated in a focus group interview, all of which for these two data points, the sur survey and the interview were done at the end after they've turned in their final report about what is their design overall. So for the student survey, uh, we had about an 88% response rate uh, we had questions focusing on a six port Liker scale on using 28 statements, focusing on five constructs, meaning, you know, questions around workload, questions around affect, teamwork, metacognition, and transfer as well. And at the conclusion of the survey, there were three open-ended questions to provide overall impressions, suggestions for improvements, ideas for uh, other future designs as well. We were wanting to know about what um, ideas that they might have put forward that could be interesting design challenges for the students to make it meaningful. The graduate teaching assistants, um, you know, we did have a focus group interview with them. And also we have a lot of follow-up sessions that we've also kind of noted um, kind of in our review logs um, from our weekly meetings about what were some of the kind of takeaways or suggestions that they might have as well. Now for the students uh, from our survey, we found that there was high levels of interest. They were really interested in having these kind of real world type problems and made it feel like they were doing something more in their learning, something that's more um, engaging or meaningful. They did make connections to their majors as well. So they thought it was um, something about, you know, the challenges being engaging enough that they could see like this kind of challenge be used by a company and maybe they're investigating something. And it helped them make them, you know, feel confident, maybe it's part of their identity in choosing the major that they're in. They did make connections both within the physics course and with other courses as well. So for example, with other courses, they did see that there were connections to Engineering 131, which was an engineering course for themselves that students were either taking concurrently or had just taken learning about engineering design itself. So again, Engineering uh, 131 is a course focusing on teaching engineering design, and these students were either enrolled real time with it or they had just taken it previously, depending upon when they uh, came into the physics course. But they did see clear connections with it. And they also recognized other connections within the course as well. And they also highlighted the idea of how they can work with other different materials or tools to express what their thinkings are. You know, there is, you know, obviously the using of hands-on equipment 
the coding aspects to explore with, but also just using other resources or equipment to share ideas and express themselves. Most students also reported that their design problems were better for learning. So there was a, a large interest as there on thinking about how they're applying physics to actually something that's tangible and also providing a meaningful challenging challenge to them as well for their learning. Now, students were split on preferring, you know, engineering design projects as a way to learn physics. Um, some thought there was a takeaway, like they're not learning the science itself and, you know, maybe that learning engineering design and physics should be kind of siloed in their specified classes. Um, or that some felt like there was a takeaway because maybe they're having challenges with coding itself. And so they're not thinking about physics as much because they're struggling with that coding um, that they're engaged in. So there's some kind of important considerations that we do need to think about. Maybe it's the epistemologies about what does it mean to learn some new uh, thing where it should be, maybe it's in a class built around that, or is it okay to learn um, different skills and, and things to know that might be, you know, interchange between classes. Now, in terms of scaffolding, um, like the directions of, of the challenges themselves, students did feel for the most part that uh, the challenges did have good specified directions um, to meaningfully engage in the tasks. Now, TA perceptions on the other hand um, are a little different. Um, so with that, our TAs, who are mostly physics uh, people by themselves, do not have experience with engineering design for the most part. And they did have a lot of concern around grading of these lab activities, which is understandable. And there was kind of, again, mixed value in should physics course or physics laboratory be focused on pure physics engagement of concepts? Or, you know, is it okay to bring in kind of these elements of engineering design? So there's kind of mixed value to that. And again, I think that's probably associated with epistemologies, but that would be something worth considering. Um, also, TAs uh, highlight a lot of suggestions for improvement around professional development. So although we had um, time spent with them at the beginning of the semester, highlighting how we're gonna bring in engineering design, what engineering design is, what are the goals of this, uh, and then having our weekly meetings, um, for improvements and kind of, again, reiterating established goals for that week, um, there was still considered needs for more training, as well as um, having a sense that we needed to provide more resources and material for students on coding itself using vPython or GlowScript because, uh, again, some students were successful with coding, some students needed a lot of resources and help with that. But on the whole, uh, for students, for their side of thinking, they found that there was a strong interest, there was connections, um, the guidance was good, but for TAs, um, they felt, you know, there is kind of this valued traditional labs type thinking. Uh, maybe there needs to be more uh, coding resources for the implementation part, as well as providing more um, trainings. In their next study, uh, later on, we were curious about, okay, we're using these engineering design activities a little bit more. And we were wanting to know what is students thinking um, and evidence-based reasoning during these activities uh, that they were having. So again, um, we focused on 14 groups that were randomly selected. Um, we focused also on their average performance to kind of justify how these students were similar to the class as well. Uh, the implementation of this was in fall 2021. And so the design challenge here was uh, having a payload of some sort of food, let's say be delivered to a remote island, again, with an endangered species, any um, you know, most minimal environmental impact that you can have. Again, it's a multi-week experience. Um, we had roughly 800 students this semester. Um, this is where we also were now uh, in class and we were using actual physical PASCO equipment as well as our simulations for coding. Like I mentioned, it's a multi-week experience and students um, were given 
the design challenge at the beginning of the week um, for the first week of implementation, had the opportunities to brainstorm. And then later in subsequent weeks, they engage in actual science learning activities, but were provided opportunities in lab to revisit back to their design to think about what will be the overall solution that they're gonna be coming up with by the end of this design uh, multi-week experience. The data that we focused on are recorded discussions that students had um, from these groups as they were working on their design solutions. We also collected their lab reports as well. Um, those are weekly reports and also the collection of their final design report that overall encapsulate um, what their final uh, decision is and the, what is the solution along with all their uh, justifications. I should also note too that in these recordings, students were um, provided question kind of prompts to kind of get them thinking um, to share and express their ideas. So the data was uh, coded and analyzed. Um, I'll kind of let you kind of read through this. Uh, we did do inter-rate of reliability. What we were really focusing on was codes pertaining to ways of thinking and the kinds of evidences that would emerge from those recorded discussions. In terms of classification of students, we used our exam two scores to classify students as high, medium, and low uh, based on their exam performance. So thinking about the kinds of codes that we had and focusing specifically on types of thinking, uh, what emerged for us were um, engineering design thinking kind of codes. So are these codes that we're centering around, you know, some aspect of engineering design in terms of, let's say, defining a problem, looking at constraints. Uh, we also had codes around science concepts. Um, so are they identifying certain principles, um, models that they might need? We had codes centered around mathematical constructs. So maybe they're identifying a formula or some kind of mathematical process and also codes centered around metacognitive thinking. In terms of evidence-based reasoning, we're looking at the types of justifications. So were they using justifications that centered around their hands-on tasks, the physical experiment itself? Were they having codes around the virtual tasks as so something about the simulations to inform? Or were they just making claims without justifications itself? And we also had an eye for any other kinds of evidences that they might be incorporating um, that may not necessarily have been directly from the experiences that they're having in lab, but maybe brought in from elsewhere. What we found overall was the mathematical coding showed up very much less frequent um, compared to the other types of codes that we had. Um, engineering design thinking, again, was kind of the bigger uh, coding construct that we had compared to science concepts. So science concepts, again, were kind of less used to inform decisions. And again, that could be attributed to this, maybe it's kind of scaffolds that we have centered around the activities. There was a big tendency to make claims without justifications, even between the high and low groups. So even high performing groups often uh, made claims without justifications, but we did notice that when they did make justifications, they used a wide range of types of evidences. They incorporated, uh, incorporated a lot of blending of the hands-on, virtual tasks, and prior knowledges. So for the low scoring groups, um, they did use utilize um, evidences around the hands-on tasks. If there was at minimum mathematical kind of construct thinking as well. For the high scoring groups, like I had mentioned, they used kind of a wider range of evidences to justify their solutions. Um, even though they also had a tendency towards making claims without justifications as well. But you know, for one, to think about you know guiding mathematical thinking. Sorry, mathematical thinking and metacognitive thinking. We do have to consider um, maybe the kinds of scaffolds that we had in place. So that needs to be further investigated. Our ongoing work right now is kind of modifying um, the design experience, where instead of just having a written overall essay at the end, we're using more what we can call computational physics essays. Um, so that is in trial. We're also having students uh, go into activities where they've had prior exposure with engineering design 
maybe earlier in the semester, but later in the semester, we're also getting students to start posing their own problems that they would investigate that would require the emphasis of multiple physics principles um, that they've learned already, but how to bring that into a, a posed problem that they have to create. Also looking at rubric development for assessing um, our final design reports. As well as again, looking at the refinement of our prompts and scaffolds, as well as looking at uh, professional development, how we can further enhance and um, looking at how we can bring in um, not just physics and mathematics, but maybe how can we can bring in biology and chemistry, computer science into um, an engaged laboratory experiment experience using engineering design. So that's kind of parts of our future work. I would like to thank my project team. And um, that is all I have. So thank you, everyone. I hope this video has been informative and gets you kind of thinking about how maybe how you can bring in engineering design into your own experiences.